television again we just ask you to take your bible and uh, follow with us verse by verse and take notes because uh, all we try to encourage people to do is to study on your own and my the rewarding phone calls we get that uh, once they get started they have to admit it is downright fun to uh, to learn how to study your bible and i think a lot of people are afraid of it because uh, they're afraid it's judgmental and it's going to condemn them and all these other things. Well, once you get into a right relationship with the Lord, why, uh, that's the last thing that you'll find. That instead, it's just a thrilling unfolding of uh, God's plan of the ages. And they can scoff all they want. But the more we study, the more we see how supernaturally this book is put together. Okay, we've got... Uh, on the board, we are in book 72, and uh, we're in the middle four programs, and this is the second program. That's our formula up there, book 72-2-2. Okay, well, let's go right back. We're still on the same theme, and will be for several more programs, of why we feel that the body of Christ, out of this age of grace, will have to be taken off the planet before God can resume his finishing up the time frame with Israel. And uh, so we're going to show how this is a unique dispensation. This is a unique period in the time of world history where God has turned from his covenant people, Israel, and has sent them aside, put them in a dispersion, which we have seen uh, sort of come to an end. There's still a lot of Jews out there, but a lot of them have already come back to the homeland. And... Uh, like I mentioned, I think, a week or two ago. Why in the world do you suppose that little nation of five, six million people is in the news every day? Every day. Uh, it's the first page I turn to in the Daily Oklahoman is the world news, and there it is, something pertaining to Israel or the Palestinians every day. Well, listen, there are other places in the world that have got problems. My, look at Darfur down there in Africa. And uh, the little island of what we used to call Ceylon, it's Sri Lanka now. My, they've had civil war for 40 years. It's never in the news. And uh, other areas. But the little land of Israel, it's in the news every day. Hated. There's more anti-Semitism coming up every day, which has been, of course, uh, the satanic uh, ploy to keep God's program from moving forward, which reminds me, I just shared with one of the guys at the break time here, I read something yesterday that just not only disturbed me, it almost made me angry. And no wonder they say now we're no longer a Christian nation. A poll has just been taken, now this was just in the last few weeks, that now I don't know which party to mention first, because I don't want this to be partisan, because one was just as bad as the other. But anyhow, I think of the Democrats, only 30% agreed to a literal, physical Satan. But the Republicans weren't that much better, 33%. Uh, well, the other way around. But anyway, almost one-third of both parties do not recognize Satan as anything to be dealt with. No wonder we're in trouble, because this book is full of his activities. 2 Corinthians 4, what does it say? The God of this world has blinded the eyes of them that believe not. Well, who's the God of this world? Satan. And uh, so I, I, I'm just, I'm flabbergasted to think that 66% of our politicians, Republicans and Democrats alike, do not believe in anything pertaining to Satan. Well, I'll tell you what, they're going to get a rude awakening one day, aren't they? So anyway, let's go back and pick up where we left off, and we're going to move ahead, and we're going to spend our time on a review which we covered eight, nine years ago when we went through all this verse by verse, so it's about time we do get some fresh uh, produ production on this, how that during this dispensation of the grace of God, not only is the plan of salvation made more simple, but the whole idea of the Christian life what it means to be in Christ and Christ in us. We're going to be looking at all these things over these next several programs, and then that will lead us up to then the fact that we have to be taken off the planet so that God can pick up where he left off with his covenant people. All right, in Ephesians chapter 3 then, and uh, we were down about in verse 4, 
whereby when you read, that is, this letter of the Ephesians especially, but all of Paul's epistles, that when you read, you may understand my knowledge, or as I showed at the closing moments of the last half hour, Peter called it what? His wisdom. That even Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. All right, this is the same uh, reference, I'm sure, that Paul's understanding of the knowledge of the mystery or the secret things of Christ. Now, verse 5 which in other ages, I can put on that whatever you want, which in other ages or other dispensations or other generations was not made known. Now look at that closely. And I hope, yeah, we got it on the screen. How that? In other ages, these things were not made known to the sons of men, that is, to the human race, as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, of course, when Paul refers to apostles, he's not referring to the twelve. He's referring to the men who were part and parcel of his ministry, Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Titus and uh, others of the of the early churches who worked with him in the ministry. All right, now then, let's look at a companion passage. Drop back to Romans chapter 16. Keep your hand in Ephesians. We're not through here yet. But come back with me to Romans chapter 16, where he says almost the same thing. And see, this is what most of Christendom totally ignores. They don't want a thing to do with it. And they don't know what you're talking about when you talk about the mysteries revealed to the Apostle Paul. But over and over, this is the thrust that Paul has of why his apostleship is different than anything else in Scripture. And yet, as Peter said in that same portion where we didn't have time to read, all of Paul's epistles are Scripture. Now, that's what Peter was inspired to write. That, Peter, that Paul's epistles are Scripture just as much as the rest of the Bible. So don't ever think, well, he probably shouldn't even be in our Bible. Don't you kid yourselves. He is in here by virtue of the work of the Holy Spirit. All right, Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power. Now there again, see, that's something Israel never understood was the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why they couldn't keep those Ten Commandments. They were always being defeated because they had no power to overcome the flesh. But see, that's a, that's a dispensational truth now for us in the church age, that the moment we become a believer, the Holy Spirit comes in and he empowers us to be obedient to the commands of God. They didn't have that before. All right, so he says the power to establish you, that is spiritually, biblically, theologically, however else you want to put it, that he can establish you according to my gospel. Not Jesus' gospel, not the words of Jesus or Peter or John, which again, Peter could have just as well said, we'll go back to John. Go back to Peter. Go back to what Jesus said. But he didn't. He says, you go to Paul. Well, that's the way God would have it, see? All right, so, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, and of course, Paul only knows Jesus Christ and him crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. So that's the Christ he's talking about. All right. So the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation or a revealing of the what again? The mystery. Over and over. These things, now just finish the verse, which was kept secret since the world or the ages began. Now this is what we have to understand. Otherwise I'm wasting my time. I can just well close the book and go home. But we have to understand that the things that were revealed to this apostle were truths, biblical statements from the uh, uh, ascended Lord that you can't find anywhere else in Scripture. It's not back there. Don't even try to find it. It's a waste of time. 
Why? Because God only revealed it to this apostle because it's such a uniquely insulated period of time from all the rest of Scripture. Now I think, oh, I got my board back. What do you know? Okay, now what we've normally done is uh, if you were to take this timeline all the way through and ignore Paul's epistle. In other words, I had a guy in Florida. I don't know whether the Lord is pleased with it or not, but it, it sure appealed to me. He said, let's look what I've done to my Bible. From Romans, let me find it, Romans 1, through Philemon, which is just ahead of Hebrews. What do you suppose he did with it? He cut it out, stapled them all together, and he had a separate little book. So now he says, what I do with people, he says, I'll approach them with my Bible, and I said, now look. If I take Paul out, and he says, I just pull it out, I hand him my Bible, now you find me the plan of salvation for today. He said, they can't do it. They can't do it. So then he says, I take my little Paul's epistles, I slip it back, and say, now you can. Well, he makes a point. See? He's making a point. I won't totally disagree with it. Because that's exactly the way it is. If you take Paul out, or if, as most preachers do, they ignore that section of the New Testament, they've got nothing for today, just empty words. Because what God said to Israel has no dealing with us today. We're not under that economy. We don't have a temple. We don't have a flock of sheep. We don't have a priesthood. See? But, oh, that's what they're trying to put us under, that everything that Jesus said... And all that, hey, that was all under the law. But oh, just remember that this portion of Scripture is strictly for us in this dispensation of the age of grace. All right, so now then, if I can go back to my board, my line, if we could take out this portion of this timeline, I'm not going to goof up because that, where, did you do this, Sharon? Okay, I'm not going to goof it up with my chicken tracks. But drop Paul out, and you'll see everything moves right straight on through to the final seven years of the tribulation and the outpouring of God's wrath on the whole human race, but it's particularly God dealing with Israel, that will trigger the second coming and the earthly kingdom. All right, now of all of Scripture, all of Scripture is looking forward to that timeline leaving Paul out of the picture. So consequently, was there any reason for God to reveal these things? No, it was moot. It didn't have anything to do with Israel. They were under their own set of circumstances. But you see, when Israel rejected everything and God set them aside with the dispersion, we had to have a new set of directions. It was imperative. You can't go through a dispensation with no directions, any words, and have a, a prescription filled with not knowing how much to take and when. I had a computer nut, and that's what she called herself. She said, we computer nuts have another word. You call it blenderizing. She said, we call it cut and paste. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's what you do. You just take what you want over here, and you paste it over here. Well, see, that's what they're doing with this precious book. They're just cutting and pasting. They're blenderizing. And I won't have a part of that. We're going to keep segregating all this and uh, keep Paul's mysteries completely separate from all the rest of Scripture. All right, now then, maybe I've made my point. Hopefully, let's read Romans 16, verse 25 once more. Because some of these verses, you, you just can't un exhaust them. Because it takes a long time for this to sink in. And look what he's saying. That him that is of power to establish you spiritually, doctrinally, according to my gospel, and don't ever forget, what's Paul's gospel? That Christ, the creator, God of the universe, took on flesh, died the death of the cross, was in the tomb three days and three nights, and arose from the dead victorious over everything. That's Paul's gospel. Why do they hate it? I can't understand it. Now, if I had a bunch of goo 
That was hard for anybody to understand. And I could say, well, no wonder. But no, it's so simple. That's the problem. It's too simple. Now it's all been done. We don't have to practice a do good religion. It's all by grace. You know, somebody gave me the latest Roman Catholic Catechism, published in 1994. You know, I read the first chapter and I was flabbergasted. I could have written it. No kidding, I could have written it. It was all by God's grace through faith in what God had done. If they'd have just stopped there. But see, then you go on into chapter 2, and there comes a little more, a little more, a little more, and pretty soon it's what it is. But same way with Martin Luther. What was Martin Luther's number one tenet when he opposed the Pope? It's by faith and faith alone. Then what happened? Well, then they bring in all this other stuff, see? But it is amazing how they just cannot rest on the simple Pauline truth that the gospel alone will save to the uttermost. And all you do is believe it. You know, I think in one of my early programs, I already used the illustration. Aren't you glad you don't have to swim some wild mountain river in order to get to the place of salvation? Aren't you glad you don't have to climb some sheer cliff to get up there and have an approach to God? Aren't you glad you don't have to drum up a million dollars before you can approach God? Well, see, that's almost what the world is making us do. You've got to do, do, do before God will have anything to do with you. No, that's not it. It's by faith and faith alone in what Christ has already done. All right, let's read the verse on into the end of it now. That the power to establish you according to my gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret. Nobody had any idea. When he came on the scene, as John the Baptist announced him, as the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world, did everybody say, oh yeah, he's going to be hung on a Roman cross? Did they know that? Well, of course not. They didn't know what John was talking about. And so he went on through his earthly ministry. And I think we looked at it the last taping. When Luke, when Jesus said, we go up to Jerusalem, everything written by the prophets will be accomplished. And he will be beaten and he'll be put to death and he'll on the third day rise from the dead. Did the twelve understand? No. God hid it from them. It wasn't time, see? All right, so now let's go quickly back to Ephesians chapter 3 again. And so this is all part of this revelation, a revealing placed right out in front of the human race, things that had never been mooted before. Not a word. All right? Verse 6, that the Gentiles, see? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ, not by works, but by the what? By the gospel. See? The finished work of the cross is what does it, beloved. Nothing else. All right? Verse 7. Whereof? Now here again, remember, it's the Holy Spirit who prompts him to say every individual word. Even the pronoun I is Holy Spirit inspired. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. Now what does that mean? Saul of Tarsus didn't deserve to get this role. Paul the Apostle didn't deserve being in this role. Do you realize what he is? You know, I mentioned, I think, again, the last taping. I'm going to repeat myself and uh, recognize that I'm repeating myself because I'm doing it on purpose. The gentleman that we heard preach several, oh, many years ago, we were uh, in a church where this gentleman was the guest speaker, and he was going to preach from Ephesians chapter 2. I'll never forget it. And you, Ethie, quickened. 
who were dead in trespasses and sin. Now, he says, while you're looking that up, he said, I'm going to make a statement. He says, not counting the Lord Jesus Christ himself, there has never lived a greater man than the Apostle Paul. Hallelujah, I agree 100%. He is by far the greatest human being in all of human history, including Moses. Now remember, we're not including Christ. But this apostle, just stop and think, for the last 1900 and some years, his gospel has been saving people across all racial lines, across all economic levels. That's never happened before. Do you realize how many true believers came through the Old Testament economy? Not many. Because in the first place, it was limited to the nation of Israel. And even in Israel, it was only a small, Isaiah says, a very small remnant who were righteous. What were the rest of them? Down the tube and gone. And so, yes, this man has had a greater impact on more people than everything else in all of biblical history. And then he is ignored, he's chastised, and he's ridiculed. You know, I, I told someone the other day that wrote and asked me about a good book about the Apostle Paul, and I said, it's hard to find. You know why? And I don't think they do it intentionally, but any time you read a book that's more or less biographical of the Apostle Paul, they tend to show all of his frailties and all of his weaknesses. Evidently, he was bow-legged, and they make a big point of that over and over, how this bow-legged little Jew, see? Well, isn't it sad? And I shouldn't have even mentioned it, should I? <laughs> but the, the guy is just completely downtrodden when he should be elevated above any other man that has ever lived. Well, anyway, this is what he's saying now here in verse 7. I was made a minister. Now, that means he was a sent one from God himself. He was a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. Having persecuted the Jewish believers for so hard and so heavily, he should have never had this opportunity. But God's grace was greater than the man's sin, and he did. He came in to be this great apostle then of the Gentile world. All right? The grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Now verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. See how he looked at himself? Paul wasn't proud. Paul wasn't puffed up or arrogant. Not at all. The least of all saints has this been given, that I should preach among the Gentiles. See, not Israel. The Gentiles. Now stop and think. Who were the Gentiles? Everybody and anybody that wasn't a Jew. Not just Rome. Not just Greece. It was the whole human race who comes under this man's apostleship. The Orient. The islands of the sea. The North people. The Russians. The Europeans. This is all part of the Gentile world to whom this man's gospel is presented. All right, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable, and I would like to use the term unfathomable, which means what? Can you plumb the depth of Christ's riches? No. No. Could you go out into space and ever reach the top of Christ's goodness and righteousness? Never. And so this is what he's proclaiming, the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's just beyond human understanding. All right, now let's read on. Verse 9, and to make all men, see, not just the privileged few, not just the rich, not the intellectual, not just Israel, but the whole human race comes under the invitation of this glorious gospel of grace. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. That God would turn to the whole human race with a gospel so simple. See? All right? To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery or the secret. Now here it comes again. 
which from the beginning of the world, from Adam, nothing has ever been revealed like this before, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, the triune God, who created all things by whom? Jesus Christ. Now, here's another point. Do you realize that except for one or two verses in John's Gospel, if I'm not mistaken, there is no other portion of Scripture that gives the creation act of everything to God the Son? God created. You all know Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God, and all the way up through Scripture, God. But you see, as soon as we get to this apostle, now, I haven't got time, but when you get to this apostle in Colossians chapter 1, he makes it so plain who spoke the word of creation. Jesus Christ, see? And only the apostle Paul makes it so plain. John, of course, in his uh, gospel, 1-1, one, one, in the beginning were the word, and the word was with God, and so forth. But nevertheless, this apostle makes it so plain that we have no shadow of doubt that the one who went to that cross and died the sin death that you and I deserve was the one who created everything in the first place. Now that's beyond human comprehension, but that's the truth of the matter. And I've said it as long as I've been teaching. He could have named the men who drove the spikes in his hands hundreds and hundreds of years before it ever happened. I've got someone who always stamps his envelope. He, uh, he died on a cross of wood and created the hill on which it stood. Well, that's exactly right. He was totally and completely the creator of everything, and yet he was the one who paid the sin debt of the whole human race. Well, only got a matter of seconds left, but the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make us see the fellowship of these things that have been kept secret since the age has begun. Now, beloved, that means what it says, and it says what it means. These things had never been revealed until it came through the pen of this one man. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.